This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now tonight, I will be welcoming Tony Edwards. I grew up watching this guy on an evening at the Improv and all the you know stand-up comedy showcases during the boom of the late 80s, early 90s. But he's been in so many great classic cult movies and TV shows. I got for movies, he was Sergeant Lemon in John Carpenter's Starman. Celebrating his 40th anniversary, he will be my second guest from it. He was also in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, shot in my hometown. He was in Hollywood Shuffle. He'll be my second guest from that. Lisa Mendy was the first. Uh, he'll be my second guest from The Experts, which had John Travolta and Ari Gross, the other guest. Uh, he'll be like my f- probably f- fifth guest from Chud 2, Chud, Bud the Chud. And, you know, he, he was on a short-lived series called Top of the Hill. Uh, he was in Hot Shots, Hot Shots Part 2. You know, he was in a pretty memorable episode of Seinfeld, The Pie. He was on Caroline the City, Family Matters, so many great TV shows and movies. And we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff tonight. And I cannot wait. And also, I want to correct something. So during the intro of my uh, interview with uh, Carrie Haim earlier, I called her. I, I so I called her Kari in the intro, and I called her uh, Kari in the introduction, which I cut, by the way. And um, I just want to. I want to, um, you know, make amends here. Her name is Carrie Haim, not Kari. And but at least I, I I mentioned Cary Grant's name just perfectly at the beginning of the intro, so okay we cleared the air on that. So yeah, here is my interview with Tony Edwards. Tommy, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> okay hi. I can hear you just fine, sir. Better than Tommy, can you see me? Right, I got that wrong. Anyway. Hi, I like the first time you've heard that before, I'm sure. Oh, I've heard it lots of times. Ted Neely did it to me, uh, you know, from Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah, he, he like, um, he called me, and, he, and then when I first answered, he was like, Tommy, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a great honor, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Sure. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting and comedy early on in your childhood? my childhood uh yeah I guess you could I guess you could say that uh it kind of started when uh my mother realized that that she told me it's like why is it you can't remember anything that I tell you to do but you can remember every word in every television commercial yeah (laughs) uh so, yeah. Uh, so she was working with uh, she was she worked for the LA school district office manager, and uh, she her the principal of her school was married to uh, a pretty famous comedian at the time. Uh, part of a comedy team, I'm not sure if you remember or heard of, uh, Burns and Schreiber. Oh, of course. Okay, yeah. So she was married to Avery Schreiber. Uh, and so uh, she's, uh, I, I don't know how the conversation worked with them, but uh, I ended up, uh, she says, well, let me see if we can have you meet my husband, blah, blah, blah. So he was working on uh, Sanford and Son mm-hmm. as a guest star that uh, that week. So I went to. Uh, it's like no show business experience at all. Ended up having lunch with Avery Schreiber and the Universal Studios commissary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, say, oh, my agent, my oh, it's just my kid, blah blah blah. Right. Well, his agent was William Morris, and of course, when I sent them that. My picture, they just kind of laughed. Uh, uh, right. All right. See you later. Uh, they didn't do that, but, you know, they said, no, thanks. Um, so then, but uh, 
by that time I was in college, so I kind of started acting when I was in college. Mm-hmm. But you had never done like school plays earlier than that. Yeah, I mean, but who doesn't do school plays? I've got some people don't do school plays, but they were just like school plays, you know. I, yeah. You know the the high school musical, you know. Yeah. Like that, but. Uh, the, uh, when I was in college, I went to Occidental College. Uh-huh. When I was in college, uh, I got uh, hired actually in my first role, which was uh, an acting role in a play. Mm-hmm. They were doing One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest oh. uh, at uh, at a little local theater, and so I played one of the orderlies in that. Yeah. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, the, the actor who played McMurphy had just come out from New York and just come to L.A. and was trying to make his way. Uh, his name was Jonathan Banks. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first time I got paid for acting. Wow. Did, did, did you play Washington, the orderly, in When Flew with the Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah, I think so. I don't quite remember. <laughs> yeah, he was a badass orderly. Him and Murphy were always at odds. Um, no, that's I so- think I was. There were two of them, and one was meaner than the other. I was the one that wasn't mean. Okay. I can't remember now. I'm sorry. It's it, a long time ago. It's all good. Wow. So you went to Occidental College. Were you there at the same time as Obama? No. Okay. Uh, I can't remember if he was before or after though. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was before. I think it was like two years before. Okay. Did you have any uh, classmates that we would know? Occidental? Yeah. No. 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 Uh, uh, no. No, not really. Roger. Can't think of his last name now. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, not really, no. So what year did you start doing stand-up? Around 1980. Okay, so it's right after the strike had happened in seventy nine. Oh, I don't even. Well, maybe it was before. Before it. No, I wasn't affected by the strike, so it had to be over by then. Okay, Did, were, were you a comedy store guy? No, I worked at the Improv. Oh, just strictly at the Improv. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's the Improv store. Here's the Improv store. So. Mm-hmm. I was taking a. Uh, 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 situation, situation comedy class, which is a class specifically for learning how to act in situation comedies, but largely based on Im- improvisation. And it was taught by a guy named Harvey Lembeck. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, you know everyone. That's oh, you'd be surprised, man. So, uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, anyway, uh, there were several comedians in the class, and so then after class, they would, like, they'd have class, and then they'd go to the improv where they had a set where they're going to meet their friends or something like that. Yeah. So, our class went to the improv after class as well and would hang out there, mm-hmm. and then one day I stuck my head into the showroom and saw what was going on, you know, yeah. and I could do that. So I think I could do that. So, I put together three minutes, and... Uh, Went to open mic night and did my three minutes, and I didn't, you know, suck. <laughs> so I decided to go back the next week. And they had this guy, there was a guy who was an MC, Larry, and uh, uh, I go, uh, go back for the next time. And they say, yeah, uh, I say uh, to Mark Lano, who's one of the owners, mm-hmm. uh, hey, uh, uh, where's Larry? I want to sign up. And he goes, oh, Larry actually doesn't work here anymore. So he's not going to be the MC. Okay. Do you want to MC the show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I said, sure, yeah. I, like, what did I, I didn't know, I think. So uh, it turns out that Mark had seen my act the week before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I didn't know that. Uh or maybe, no, he had to have seen it the week before. So anyway, I worked there for about 10 years. I was the main MC at the Improv. 
and I brought up everyone from a- everyone who, who was anyone who wasn't strictly a comedy store comic, you know. Uh, yeah, because there's a feud. Them. There's a feud between Bud and Mitzi. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I did that, and then, uh, of course, I you know, then I had got regular sets of the improv, and then I got to, you know, do the improv in Las Vegas and the improv cruise and the improv uh, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, and all that stuff. And the uh, evening at the improv. Oh yeah, that's why. Twice, I, that's what, three that's times. I, first, I can't remember. Yeah, that's why I first saw you was on evening at the improv. Yeah, and you know, half hour comedy hour. Uh, yeah. On MTV and Comedy Central. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah. Did you ever get on the Tonight Show or Letterman or any of no. that? No. No. Nope. Jim 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 McCauley didn't give you the time of day. <laughs> you know what? I guess not. I don't really remember exactly. I couldn't tell you what I. I can't tell you what I thought he thought of me because I don't remember it that well. I was like, yeah. You know, yeah, because I think every comic from that time has a Jim McCauley story, at least, you know. But, yeah, I mean, he was he was around. He was always going out to the clubs to find people. Um, mm-hmm. So when you when you were at the Improv, when you got there in 1980, uh, was Kevin Nealon bartending? Mm, no, he not, was not bartending. I don't think so. Yeah, he was, he was yeah, bartending maybe he for was, a while. Yeah, maybe he was, actually. Maybe he was. Maybe he was. Yeah, because when when the strike was sure. when the strike was going on, he was there when um, when uh, Jackie Bananas was on stage. Jack Raymond was on stage, and then that fire broke out. You know that mysterious fire that no one knows who who caused it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I was after that. Yeah. So when you were there, like, who were the comics? Oh, um, Robin Williams, Bill Maher. Yeah. David Spade. I'm out, it's like I could I could go on forever, really. Yeah. Just about everyone. Just about everyone. You know. Yeah. I, I would. I. You know. Everyone who wasn't a comedy store exclusive. Yes. And so we would get comedy people, guys who play at the comedy store, but who were big enough to not be affected by. Right. Playing at the improv. Right, like Jay Leno and um, uh, got Steve Landisberg. Probably, uh, I, I think, I don't think Jimmy Walker was playing the improv anymore by the time he was in L.A. I think him and Bud had a falling out or something. But, like, yeah, big, big level uh, people could play both clubs. But if Mitzi found out that one of her lower level guys was being disloyal, you know, she'd kick them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh... Did you, did, do you know the, uh, <laughs> this is my, this is my favorite show, this story, the Seinfeld story. Uh-huh. So you know that story. Oh, about, um, yeah, he, uh, he got fired after one night because he didn't want to, uh, you know, play by her rules or something. No, 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 but that, here, I'll tell you. Okay. So, Jerry's working at the improv. He's working on, you know, he's doing his set, but he would always work out uh, the bumpers for his show. You know, the the uh, the work out the improv, the stand up part at the beginning, at the end of the show. Oh yeah. So he he would always work on those. And I mean, I was in five days a week, six days a week. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many days a week. Every night, just watching comedians over and over and over and over again. So he does this joke about, uh, and you'll probably know it. Mm-hmm. About the uh, the uh, when, uh, when the, is are there keys to uh, to the airline to the jet plane? You go to go on a plane. Are there keys, or does the pilot ever leave him at home? He has to get on the on the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, system and go. Uh, uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen. This is your ca- captain speaking, and uh, ah, this is so embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I, I left the keys at home, right? Yeah. So I'm watching it, and I thought of a funny line. Mm-hmm. to go at the end uh, and it, I thought it was so good I wrote it down and I gave it to him yeah 
Uh, so, and the line was, you know, that's why why you're sitting on the plane. You see all those all those technicians under doing stuff under the plane. They're looking for the hide a key under the wing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. So. Uh, and then, and then I would come up with other ideas. But then, on the other hand, it's like you know, comedians—they don't really want to. If they're good writers, they really don't need to use anyone else's material. It probably hurts them. So, I, and I understood that. Mm -hmm. But I had great ideas. So anyway, one day I just decided to call him uh, at, at the office uh, and left him, and I left a message for him. And I come home and. I'm um, living this this woman this woman right now. He goes, uh, Jerry Seinfeld left a message on your answering machine. Oh, really? he goes, oh hi, hi Tony, this is Jerry. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, keep it coming, man. We're we're on the same comedy light boat. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Yeah. So next, and then not uh, uh, oh, and then uh, about a week later or so, I'm in uh, uh, Baja Fresh, the little Mexican restaurant across the street from Redwood Studios. And uh, uh, Larry David is sitting there by himself. Yeah. Now, I know Larry David from the improv as well. You know what I mean? When yeah. it was on Friday. So uh, I go, so I go up to him, hey, I, and I said, uh, hey, Larry, Tony Edwards, if you remember me from the improv, uh, I just want to tell you, I love the show. It's awesome. Keep up the good work and thank you. And Lee and walked away and he goes, wait, 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 wait. He goes, you're an actor, aren't you? Goes, yeah. He goes, okay, uh, uh, call my office tomorrow. I may have something for you. So I call him the next day. No, nah, it's not going to work out, but, you know, we'll, we'll figure out something. And then I get a call uh, a couple of months later or something. I get a call from my agent. Oh, okay, you got an audition for Seinfeld. Yeah. Go, oh, all right. That's cool. So uh, I go in straight to producers, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sitting there with all the and businessman number two. I'm sitting with all these other businessmen number two there in the room. And uh, uh, and um, Jerry Seinfeld comes in. Mm. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Good to see. You. Hey, thank, thanks again for that joke. I'll see you inside. <laughs> <laughs> and then and and then Larry David comes in. Hey, Tony. Hey, good to see him. See, I told you, bring him right. And he goes through. Michael Richards comes in. I know him from the improv. Yeah. They go, hey, Michael, hey, hey Tony. And this is the, the Kramer's thumbs up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and all the other guys in the, in the room are just looking like me. They, they want to kill me, you know? It was like, oh, fuck. You know, because so many times you've seen that happen. You're an actor, and that you see that happen, and you go, fuck. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so this time, I was that guy. So I uh, got the part. Did the show, uh, and then that was it. Except for about you know, fifteen years later, Jerry Seinfeld goes. Oh, oh. Uh, so the, the, the part that's uh, in the episode is called the pie. The pie. It's, uh, yes. The pie. Uh, season five, episode fifteen. Uh, Jer uh, uh, um, George has has heated the suit away from the other portly guy and he's wearing it for a business interview right yeah, so yeah. he's at the lunch and uh uh george notices that the sh the guy that he cheated the suit from is the chef of that restaurant yeah and then the waiter says hey uh uh, uh, uh please enjoy your cream pie and, uh the chef made it especially for you and george is not going to eat it and i the boss says take a bite i insist and i say if you're one of us, you'll take a bite. And that was it. All right. So then fast forward, I don't know how many years ago. 2014, maybe? Yeah. No. 2016. Uh, uh, I'm on Reddit. I don't know why I was on Reddit. I don't know how I stumbled upon it. I wasn't a Reddit person. Reddit or them, but, uh, but um, Jerry Seinfeld's on Ask Me Anything. Someone got said. Someone writes in, are there any lines that you lose, that you use in your real life from the show? Uh -huh. He says, well, actually, there is only one line. And it's pretty obscure. I'm not sure if anyone will remember it. But the line is, if you're one of us, you'll take a bite. 
<laughs> I use it with my kids to try to get them to eat something when they don't want to eat it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the story. And the funny thing about that light, it sounds like a cult thing, you know? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it is. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's part of the click. I, I remember... Yeah. I remember you had a, a bit about working at Magic Mountain. Did that really happen to you? Yeah. Yeah, I grew up in the valley, man. Yeah. I grew up in uh, Pacoima, halfway, halfway between Magic Mountain and Hollywood. North Hollywood. Hollywood. I'm a valley kid. Yeah. Well, Disneyland in those days was much better than it is now. I got to see the tail end of it around 1990, 91. It was the old Disneyland. And then, you know, it started It started getting to the Disneyland that we know it today. I haven't been there since, but just based on pictures I've seen, you know, it was a lot better back then. Um, you guest starred on two episodes of The White Shadow. How were those experiences? Um, fine. I don't remember very much about it, really. I wasn't... uh, I don't think I was, like, awestruck by the experience of being on a set. Mm -hmm. So, it's like something really special had to happen for me to remember it. So, uh, I think I did a good job. That's about all I remember. Did I do a good job? I think I did a good job, you know. Uh, um, Yeah. I, I never saw this. I never saw those particular episodes, but yeah, I was just curious because uh, Ken Howard. Well, that was the first TV show I'd ever done. Right. Is that uh, Ken Howard and Bruce Paltrow, who mm-hmm. was the writer producer mm-hmm. of the show? Yeah, he, he's mm-hmm. no longer with us, and that's Gwyneth's father. So, was uh, Star Man a standard audition for you? <clears throat> well, it, it, it... no, I don't think so. Uh, I've always been a John Carpenter fan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when my girlfriend found out that it's going to do this John Carpenter movie, and she she hates slasher movies. Oh no, it's going to be oh, oh no, it's going to be great. It's completely different. Blah blah blah. Um, I was pretty basic, you know. I got the lines. And it was like a '71 Ford uh, Mustang, license plate, blah 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 blah, headed west, blah whatever. Uh, uh, but. Uh, no, I just read for it. He liked me, and I got the part. <laughs> but it yeah. was really cool. It was like the first, uh, that was my first film I'd ever done. Uh, first time, you know, going on location to uh, Tennessee and Las Vegas. And uh, I remember I got there. Uh, oh, I saw, I saw Charles Martin Smith at Burbank Airport when we were leaving. Uh-huh. Going to Vegas because we went to Vegas first, uh, and um, I chatted a little bit with him. And then when we got out, he said that he'd gotten a, a call a call from Jeff Bridges, tell him to come up to the room that when he gets in. Mm-hmm. And I go, oh, okay. and and then Charles goes, oh, you should come. You should come with me. Will you, you come with me? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then he goes, see later, listen, I can't make a guy to do something. Go ahead and go by yourself, and I'll catch up later. I'm like, Re- really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went in, and it was Jeff Bridges and a friend of his and Karen Allen and, uh, and me, I think, <laughs> in this room. And Jeff was recording. He had a little recording set up. And so he was recording him playing and singing songs and doing all, you know, I remember, uh, I, uh, oh, I sang The Weight, that's right, I sang The Weight by the band, mm-hmm. and uh, sing, 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 and get to the end of the song, and Charlie comes in and goes, and we all go, oh, you missed it, he just finished, and we play back the thing, all the way back, to, oh, you missed it, <laughs> it was funny, uh, so, uh, super sweet guy, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better first experience on a movie possibly the best experience on a movie I had a great time yeah yeah were you guys in um, Arizona or Memphis when you were filming I was not in Arizona I was in uh, Tennessee Memphis and Tiptonia okay 
Kittonia, Tennessee. It, uh, uh, and it rained a lot, too, and, and they had weather problems, so uh, it, the shoot got extended, so uh, I would hang out with uh, Charles Martin Smith, because they had all this time and nothing to do to see the see the sights of Tiptonia. <laughs> uh, and you know, I was like, but uh, it was great. Yeah, it, the whole movie looks like it was freezing cold. You know, there's lost snow and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I wasn't there for the cold part. Yeah, but you saw. They it told really. me it was cold. Special Karen said in the back of that truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something I, I found out that I thought was interesting is that when the movie was pitched, it was pitched as a sci-fi. It happened one night because of, of Gable and Claudette Colbert. They're on the road bickering with each other. It's it's kind of the same thing mm-hmm. with this movie, you know. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Richard Jekyll. I mean, he was a very talented actor. Yeah. But then um, you got to do a Star Trek uh, movie, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, which was shot mm-hmm. in my hometown, San Francisco. And mm-hmm. uh, I saw this at the drive-in when I was three. I fell asleep in the back seat. It was on a double bill with Heartbreak Ridge, the Clint Eastwood war movie. And um, the next week we, we went to go see The Golden Child with Eddie Murphy in the same situation and fell asleep. Uh, what was it like working with uh, Leonard Nimoy as a director? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have no stories about him. He was he was really nice uh, uh-huh. and uh, didn't uh, treated me like uh, like a professional actor, you know, regardless yeah. of the experience or whatever. Uh, yeah, he was a sweet guy. Actually, I, and then, and then, this is funny, I think. Uh, but mm-hmm. I was a huge Star Trek fan, of course. Yeah. This, even before, even before that. Um, so years later, I was working as a personal Mac consultant. Mm-hmm. When I stopped doing stand-up. Uh, and uh, my friend... Uh, who was a um, oh my god a uh, 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 low voltage electrician uh-huh. right so he goes Tony I've got this client I need help with because uh, uh, I'm doing some stuff for him but he's got a Mac and I really don't know Mac can you come over and, and you know work on this with me oh sure yeah he goes, oh by the way yeah the client is Leonard Demoy and I go oh good catch up <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you know, went to his house and worked on his, his iPad and uh, mainly on the iPad. But uh, the main thing I remember it's and really really super sweet guy and his wife. And uh, uh, but the one thing I really remember is sitting at his desk and uh, looking over and seeing this about two inch square lucite cube mm-hmm. with ear tips in them <laughs> the ear tips the ear tips yeah, yeah the ear tips the that's Vulcan ear tips yeah <laughs> yes yeah yeah that's pretty wild uh, it's, it's funny because Nimoy directed 3 and 4 and if you look at them they don't look like they were directed by the same guy 3 looks like it kind of look, it looks like a made for tv movie it's very flawed but then in four it looks like he got better as a director it's a lot more it looks more artsy as a mainstream film it's a, it's a way better film i think i think it's the best sequel next to ratha khan i just I, you know i think what made it is the story yeah the story and the and the humor of going back in time yeah, them. and that whole it's got that environmental message you know about the whales and stuff too which is interesting Yeah, it's funny because uh, Jane Wheedland from the Go-Go's is in the movie and she's been an activist of, of, of animal rights especially mer- the marine animals for a very long time and uh, of course the horror icon Michael Berryman's in the movie the, the bald guy with the scary face he's actually one of the sweetest guys in the world I've interviewed him, and I've met him a couple times. Then um, 
you get to do Hollywood Shuffle. I take it you knew Robert Townsend from Stand Up. Yes. Yeah, that that whole scene, that whole nightmare scene where you know he's at the audition with all the Eddie Murphy lookalikes. I mean, that's that's Hollywood in a nutshell. I couldn't tell you how many actors I've talked to who have told me that they've gone to an audition and there's a hundred guys there that look like them. You know? Yeah. 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 But that's what the whole movie was about. Yeah. Yeah, and I've talked to I talked to Lisa Mendy, and she says that just you guys were just all laughing the entire time making that movie and stuff. Like anything stand out from being on set? No, <laughs> really. I mean, it's I have vague memories of it. I mean, uh, no, but but I just but these are. It's maybe it's because it didn't feel like it was on set because these are all the, you know, I'm surrounded by all these guys that I know. Anyway, yeah. you know, yeah. like uh, it was like a, a project as opposed to being, you know, it obviously it wasn't film, but it's like more like a, almost like a social project or something. I don't know. Yeah. So it just, yeah, it didn't feel like a set because you know your friend is in control and he's making it like a it, he's making it like a stand up comedy environment where everyone's on set and gets to make a movie. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it's important, you know. Yeah. Uh, How about uh, making the experts? Mm, the experts. Well, I had. A, f- a couple of friends who were best friends, I think really best friends with John Travolta. Uh-huh. So uh, I, when my agent, I don't know exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. It probably did, but that's how I ended up getting it. And then my two friends were also on set too, so I was up there with them. Uh, that was like, that was like a pretty, you know, except for the quality of the film, <laughs> but that was a good time in my career. Cause I just, I worked on that. Oh no. Before that, uh, oh, I worked on that mm-hmm. and then in Canada and then I got cast in a TV show mm-hmm. and that shot in, shot in Vancouver a pilot, uh-huh. and then we had to go back for reshoots for the experts again in Canada, and then I got cast in the series again in Vancouver. So I was in Canada a lot. Mm-hmm. Vancouver. Yeah, a long time ago. Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> it was beautiful. I really enjoyed I, that was That was like, I mean, Starman was great because it was the first time and I got to travel and do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the experts was like, again, like I had my two friends, they were, they're executive producers. Uh, and, uh, it was fun. Yeah. We, we had a good time. I wish the movie had been better. Yeah, because I, I talked to Ari Gross a couple of times, and one of the times he told me, yeah, there was a lot of script changes, there was a little bit of friction between Dave Thomas and the producers, um, I think the studio changed hands, like, at the time that it was being released, so it wasn't marketed correctly, you know, there's a lot of stuff surrounding that movie, there's some, there, it's, a, it's a good idea, though, you know, it's a funny idea, but, yeah, it, it's sad when things like that happen sometimes, um, <clears throat> I've talked to many from Chud 2, Bud the Chud, and nobody is proud of this movie. I'm sure you're on that list as well. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm not. Uh, it's, it's... You know, I have very, again, that was like a very non... Uh, 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 an inconsequential mm-hmm. movie for me. I mean, I, I have like... I think I have one or two lines. I don't know. Uh-huh. I'm in the very big. I'm doing the credits. I'm doing the, I'm doing the opening titles. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the movie <laughs> hasn't even started. I'm already out of the movie because I get killed really quickly. Uh, so, uh, I mean, yeah, I did it. <laughs> so I can say I did it. <laughs> yeah, a couple comedians are in there: Joanne Deering and Rich Scheidner, and 
a couple good actors from 80s movies. Um, that series you mentioned, was that Top of the Hill? Yes. Yeah, William Cat, another sweet guy. I've met him. What was that experience like doing that show? Oh, that was, you know, that was great because I really got to, and you know, usually go on location and you're working on a movie and you don't have a lot of free time. But for this show, I did. So I would have days when I didn't work. And I was, I'm in Vancouver, Canada. I'm staying at a really, really nice hotel, apartment hotel. Yeah. I got the money. You know, I was yeah. like, ah, I I could get into this. Yeah, it was great. And, the, and uh, the people on the show were really, really fun to work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a, uh, the cast was a nice little team. Unfortunately, I left them abruptly uh, when my character committed suicide by jumping off the balcony of the 16th floor of his apartment building, which I actually did that stunt myself. Oh, yeah? They had, yeah, they had built up scaffolding. It wasn't 16 stories high, but they built up scaffolding up to the bottom of the floor below my floor. Mm-hmm. So I could step up onto the rail and jump off and then land right on a pad right below it. <laughs> I thought that was really something I've always wanted to do, like a stunt like that. Um, so that was fun. Wow. Uh, and then I was off the show. And the show didn't really go. I only was some, I think it's only one season anyway. Yeah, it, it probably wasn't a good show, and probably the, the time slot wasn't good. That's yeah, off- conversation. That's often with the case with a lot of those shows that didn't last. Um, you were on the show Coach uh, with Craig T. Nelson. How was that experience? Again, don't remember much about it. Uh, did um, you know? Did you know Craig T. Nelson was a comedy store comedian? No. Oh yeah, yeah him and uh, Barry Levinson and Rudy DeLuca. They were a comedy team at the comedy store. Huh. Yeah. Well, I was at the improv all the time, so I didn't really kind of know what was going on up there. Oh, oh by the time you was, by the time you got into comedy, they were out of they were out of the act. But but like in the early days in the seventies, oh yeah, they were like big. They made that place. <laughs> well, one one thing that I know that happened to me, which was affected the trajectory of my career, mm-hmm. was that before. Before I started started doing stand up comedy, I was doing television commercials. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't do a lot of them, but I did do some. And I was, you know, when I got one, it was like really good money for a young guy like me. So, whereas a lot of uh, most other comedians would, you know, well, first of all, most other comedians would come from other parts of the country to Los Angeles to be discovered or whatever yeah. it is to do their career. I was already in Los Angeles and I was already working as an actor. So it didn't make sense for me to go out on the road 20, 30, 40 weeks out of the year when mm. I, I could just stay in town and audition for stuff. <clears throat> and so right. a lot of the relationships that comedians build with other comedians happens on the road. You know, you do a week with someone, blah, 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 and then you go back to the same place and you go all these things. And I never had any of that. Mine was really kind of just focused on the improv. Right. Um, so there are a lot of comedians that I never worked with for that reason because maybe they were East Coast, never made it out to the improv or, or yeah. Yeah, during the 10 years I did stand-up, I never went on the road. Nobody would ask me, so I stayed, you know, at Rooster Tea Feathers and the San Jose Improv near the end there, and now that's what I did, so I totally get it, you know. But, um, let's see, I mean, I think a lot of people remember you as the as the uh, driver with the 3D glasses in Hot Shots Part Duh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was... Uh... That was a that was a super fun day, super fun day. Yeah, it was just a like one day thing, but yeah, it was a blast, and I I love that I love that clip. It's funny, um, yeah. It's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty funny. I uh, do I have any stories about that? No, it's just like it was really cool. I was really kind of shocked, so much shocked 
when um, they decided me to, as a gag, at the very end, you know, when they're in bed and she's shooting off the gun, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I come up the window, and go, what, you want me to actually carry one of your cameras? <laughs> yeah. You're going to actor carry one of your cameras for a, a gag? <laughs> yeah. All right, that was like amazing. Yeah, and these, are the, and these are the guys who made the airplane movies too, so that must have been mm -hmm. a huge honor. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Charlie Sheen was nice. Brenda Blackie was nice. Everyone was nice. Uh, it was very. It seemed like it was very funny. They seemed like they were laughing behind the camera. So, uh, yeah. yeah. School. You did a, a bunch of uh, Caroline the City episodes. Leah Thompson, another sweet lady. I she was the first Who person, am I think? first person I ever met at a comic con, and she was just fantastic. Yeah, how was that experience? Uh, honestly, don't oh. remember much about it. <laughs> just a uh, job in and out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a, that's mostly what they are. You know, I mean, yeah. It's different now, but if you're an African American actor, I had a joke where you go, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm an actor and I can get an audition at any time. So I always try to be prepared. In fact, I have a security guard outfit in my trunk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is you, you have security guards, cops, soldiers, you know, yeah. businessmen who don't say anything. Uh, that's basically, uh, with a few exceptions, of course. And now, of course, it's completely different, which is different. It's great. Yeah, so you, you mentioned before that uh, yeah, you went into consulting. Is that what you still do? Now? Yeah. Now, now I don't do anything. Now I have Retired. my life is fucking awesome. <laughs> it's great. My life is just like, I can't even. I can't even believe that I'm here. I never thought that I would end up here after all those years. Yeah. I mean, as I speak to you right now, I'm standing out in my front yard, and as you can tell, it's super, super quiet and peaceful. Yeah. There's the gurgling of a pool. There are dragonflies flying around. There's a plumeria tree in front of my house. The sky is it's it's warm and it's the air is super clear. It's very, it's pretty hot, but, mm -hmm. you know, and humid. Uh, the house that I live in, it just, just blows my mind. It just, that I could live in a house like this, which is mm -hmm. super unique and modern and, uh, and yet kind of not rustic, but kind of wild too. Uh, for for uh, $750 a month. Wow. <laughs> Wow, you don't hear that no it's more. It's unbelievable. Especially here in California, and, you don't hear that no more. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, how could I move back to L.A.? I mean, even if, you know, even if, and I'm, I'm older, so there, there, there must be a lot fewer parts for me, even even fewer parts than were when I'm younger, though they're using, you know, it's more diversity in television now, a lot more. Yeah. But it's usually young people, young, good-looking people, right? Right. So, um, I, between my social security and my screen actors go pension, which is not very much, but combined mm -hmm. the two covers all of my bills, including health care, uh, and leaves enough left over to, it's not a lot, but there's enough left over that I don't, I can, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> every day uh, so here what I do is I I've been involved in theater a little bit uh, we've done a couple of plays that I've uh, directed and been in at a large theater here in Phuket basically the only large theater in Phuket really is kind of unusual anyway uh, I do photography mm -hmm. um, I basically Basically, portrait photography. I was doing uh, video for a long time, but I kind of stopped uh, because 
who needs more videos? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know it's, and oh and uh, for 15 years starting in two, starting in 2002 uh -huh. to 2015, I attended every single Burning Man. Okay. Uh, when I left comedy, that's the, it, I was gra gravitated to that community. Uh, and that's where I started taking a lot of pictures and I started uh, shooting events. And uh, I, I met a woman who I would later on marry, met her at Burning Man, engaged at Burning Man, married at Burning Man. Mm -hmm. Right. And then in uh, 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 20... 15, uh -huh. she and I were on our motorbike in North Hollywood, and there was a freak accident, and she was killed in the accident. Uh, and I broke my and, and I broke my leg. Don't be sad. Don't be sad. Uh -huh. Happy ending. Uh, <laughs> don't be sad. Uh, and uh, so uh, it took me uh, a little, uh, almost a year to uh, recover. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, I asked myself, what do I, you know, what's next? That's the question. Oh, there are two questions. Uh, there are two questions. The first question was, uh, you know, why is, why is Laura dead? And the answer, and, and this comes from, uh, following yeah. a book called The Power of Now. I'm sure you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Power of Now? I have never heard no. of it, but it sounds pretty thought-provoking. Well, actually, it's it's yes and the opposite. Mm -hmm. Basically, I, so basically, I had studied it before, uh, before that time for a couple of years, and sort of started uh, doing the things that it was saying to do, which is basically, is the basis. It's... Uh, um, uh, the present moment is all there is. Anything else is past or future, and past and future don't exist because they only exist in your mind. That's the only place they exist. Okay. When you have a when you, know, when you say to yourself, "I have a thought," right, or "I think," mm -hmm. it means there's a separation. There is the thought, mm -hmm. and there's you, and so it comes to an understanding of that. That the 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 you that comes before anything else, your name, your, anything associated with that you is who you really are. Right. And and we use thought to um, make our way through the world. I mean, so it makes humans good at being human because we have logic. We can create. We can we can create. That's the main thing. We can create. Whether we we create. Uh, uh, a, a telephone, mm -hmm. or whether we create um, everything is creation. Yeah. So, so that's that's the basic underpinning. Uh, and uh, so after the accident, uh, I decided, uh, you know what? Maybe I want to do something that I haven't done. I'm going to go visit Southeast Asia, and uh, for six months, that old money saved up, and. Uh, uh, my friend, who is from, also from Los Angeles, well, you should go to uh, come to Phuket, get a small apartment, and you know, mm -hmm. use it as your base of operation, and then travel around, and boys come back here. So, all right, so I, I did that, and it didn't take me long to realize that you know it would be super easy to live here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have you know no wife, no kids. Family is kind of not really terribly close, you know. Yeah. And I'm just going to try to stay here for a while and see what happens. And that was seven years ago. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I had my accident nine years ago, and I'm celebrating the anniversary of this weekend. It's just, it's been so phenomenal because I kept saying the whole time I was in the hospital, what's next? What's next? You know, it, it took me a while, but here I am. Oh, yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry. I, I forgot my point. The point being, oh. it's like, what do I do? That's another thing that I do. Um, I, I write. 
uh, I make videos about mindfulness. Mm-hmm. I have a website called um, The Burning Log, theburninglog.com. Also on Twitter, I mean, not, not Twitter, Jesus. Uh, also on uh, uh, Instagram, uh, mm-hmm. The Burning Log. The Burning Log, nice. The Burning Log, yes. Do you have any plans of writing a memoir? Well, of course. I like everyone else. You you toy about you you think about it, but whether it'll happen or not, I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, it's not that I'm not just this. Like, yeah. One, you know, one thing one thing that uh, that uh, I I try to be aware of is my own ego. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's the normal regular idea of ego. Eckhart Tolle has a slightly different idea uh, uh, about it, but in either case, uh, it's uh, it, you know it can ground you another mm-hmm. in a good way, grounded in a good way. Uh, mm-hmm. You because you ask yourself. I, well, I ask myself all the time. Am I doing this because I am creating, or am I doing this for ego? Mm-hmm. And that's that's what it means to be mindful, because it, all it means is that you listen to your thoughts without attaching yourself to them, mm-hmm. because they're just you know, it, you know, you're. The part of you that's really you, call it being, if you will, or call it consciousness, whatever it is, it just sees these, you know, it sees, it sees these things. And, and if you can't realize that you're separate, separate from them, mm-hmm. then you will start to believe them. And that is what <laughs> is wrong with the world today. I totally everything, agree. Everything. Everything that's happening, the things that we just can't believe, that can't understand why it's happening, it's all human ego, and it's all separation from consciousness. Right. When you're separate from, when you, you know, and that, that's all it is, because the ego can never be satiated. Only when only when the moment that you get what you want is satiated and then it goes right into for something else. So whether it's fame, money, power, uh, usually those, fame, money, power. Yeah. Uh, but not always. Sometimes it's uh, pity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's, it's all these things. And if you cannot separate yourself from these thoughts... They will destroy you, right? And they will destroy this this planet. And I and I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I could see it happening easily. Yeah, this whole world is all full of narcissism, and it runs rampant on TikTok and all the freaking influencer platforms. It disgusts me. It really does, man. I never thought we were going to get to this point in our society. Okay. So okay. Okay. Let's stop this. Okay. Uh, it disgusts you. Yes. What can you What can you do What can you do about that? I could not pay attention, not watch. <laughs> That's about it. Or. Uh huh. Yeah. Or or or. See, that's the problem when you when you don't pay when you say simply not pay attention, simply not watch. Uh-huh. Is, uh huh. Is like what most people do when they want to get away from it. Yeah. But. You know, until they're able to say, well, you know, to not to not react to it. Right. Non-reaction. Non-reaction. In other words, that is someone else's thought creating another thought in my head. However, I am not my thought, so I can ignore that. Right. But the thing is, you have to be able to know that you're doing it. You have to do that consciously. You have to make make the conscious decision to say, not that that's bad, 
or not that I'm going to ignore that, but conscious to say, all that is, is a thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, I don't know, maybe something will happen and, and people will, something, probably something really bad will happen and some for some reason people will start to get it in the meantime the only thing that you can do about it is to do it locally you know you have to do it yourself and for your own life and that's the only life that you can be responsible for absolutely Tony thank you so much for coming on tonight I really appreciate it no problem. Oh, tonight, yes, it is night there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no problem. It's fun. Absolutely. Um, I hope you have a blast over there in Bangkok and keep being creative and be safe out there. Oh, okay. I'll I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> have a good night, Tony. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, Tony Edwards. Ain't he a cool dude? What a fascinating, deep, insightful, and interesting guy. And that's all I've got to say. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes! <laughs>